Good evening. I am Marta Sitches. I am very happy to welcome you to from Paris to the episode one of a three episode series on tricuspid valve regurgitation. Today we will focus on the natural history and prognosis of tricuspid uh, valve disease. Why should you attend this program? today particularly. Our objectives today are to learn about the anatomy of the tricuspid valve and the classification of tricuspid regurgitation, to discuss the most appropriate method to quantify tricuspid severity, and finally to get familiar with prognosis and clinical scenarios based on different TR etiologies. To this aim, I have the pleasure to share uh, here today with a big, fantastic team here in Paris with Dr. Fabian Pras, interventional cardiologist from Switzerland, uh, Professor Marco Mertra, uh, heart failure specialist from Italy, uh, Professor Rebecca Hahn from New York, uh, good morning there, and also our remote speakers from Tel Aviv, Dr. Jan Topilski, uh, Denisa Muraro from Italy, and also from France, Erwan Donald. Welcome you all and welcome to all the audience. But first of all, we are going to meet our patient. All these episodes are going to be focused on a patient. So the first thing that we are going to do is to, to meet this patient that is presented by also our colleagues in Toulouse that are going to show you uh, this video. So Nicolas and Laurent, uh, today we have to discuss a patient with a severe tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, so uh, if we start with the uh, history of the patient, 75 years old lady, not too overweight, with a past history mainly dominated by a um, mitral surgery with a bioprosthesis that was inserted uh, three years ago. Quite a complex surgery with a redo uh, surgery for a cardiac tamponade and that there was already a kind of tricuspid regurgitation that was left as it was at that time. Atrial fibrillation, as we can see on the ECG, uh, with narrow QRS, and the patient is highly symptomatic and we are checked class three with limb edema ascites. Uh, so she deserves something. As you can see, the six minute walk distance is only 160 uh, meters. So a couple of uh, laboratory uh, investigation, just to uh, highlight the fact that the uh, renal function is mildly impaired. The liver function is normal, high proBNP, and in terms of medications, the treatment is adequate with a high diuretic dosage and that oral anticoagulant for the atrial fibrillation. Uh, so Laurent, uh, if we come to the echo assessment, there are very uh, important findings for this lady. Okay, in echo, the heavy is not dilated, the ejection fraction is at 47%. The mitral barrier prosthesis uh, is uh, okay with mean gradient 5 and no uh, MR. She doesn't have significant aortic valve disease. Right ventricle is uh, moderately dilated with a, a moderate impairment in the ARV because type C is around 15 millimeters with a severe secondary tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, she has moderate uh, hypertension, uh, pulmonary hypertension at 49 millimeters of mercury. And uh, she has severe secondary tricuspid regurgitation according to the different uh, quantification. Eroa is at 0 0.7 and vena contracta 9 millimeters. And the uh, uh, tricuspid annulus is uh, mildly dilated at 42 millimeters. Okay, a few images of the echo. You can see the severity of the tricuspid regurgitation. On the second image, uh, you have the um, transgastric view, and you can see that you have. A TR all along the septal leaflet in the anteroceptal and posteroceptal commissure. And we can expect a few difficulties in this patient because of the shadow uh, linked to the uh, presence of the mitral valve. So as you can see on the right part of the image, the shadow makes that it's difficult to see the septal leaflet. Yeah, we can see that. And Nico, so um, as part of the assessment of the angio and the hemodynamics of this uh, patient? Yeah, nothing remarkable on the coronary angiogram. And right heart catheterization just shows elevated uh, wedge pulmonary uh, capillary pressure related to the past history of left sided valve uh, disease and moderately impaired LD function. Uh, no severe pulmonary hypertension and uh, a severe um, consequence of the TR on the right arterial pressure. 
On the CT scan, we confirm the, the dimensions, the assessment of the dimensions of LV, RV cavity. What is noticeable is the angulation between inferior vena cava and tricuspid annulus, and the quite small dimension of mm -hmm. uh, a right ventricle, and uh, this uh, will be incorporated in our um, thinking about the solution we could offer mm -hmm. to this patient. So if we go uh, to the risk scores, high risk patient, Euro score a logistic above 20%, Euro score too close to 10%, SCS score close to 7%, so definitely a high risk patient. So if we want to summarize, uh, these are the key clinical data and angiographic reference of this patient. So 70 years old female with a past history of mitral bioprosthesis, highly symptomatic, uh, related to a severe uh, functional uh, tricuspid regurgitation. We have the metrics of the uh, left ventricular and right ventricular function. And so I guess it's time for discussion uh, about this patient. So fantastic presentation from the team in Toulouse. So we have already met our patient that we will follow during the workout of these three episodes. Dr. Professor Mertra, what do you think? What, what, what should we propose? What should we, how should we manage this lady? What do you think? It's a very nice, interesting, and uh, I would say also a, a very good clinical case. Uh, for some reasons. First, he had the mitral valve surgery, but uh, because of the surgical procedures, uh, uh, the, the, the tricuspid regurgitation, which was already present, uh, was not treated at the time of surgery. Then the patient had a, a progression of uh, heart failure, and uh, there are some important aspects. One is uh, that uh, is uh, severely limited, uh, the six-minute work test uh, distance was very uh, low and uh, he had uh, severe symptoms. He needed high doses of diuretics, which is uh, a, pro a poor prognostic sign in the patients with heart failure. On the other hand, his uh, uh, air renal function was uh, still uh, uh, relatively preserved, above 50 ml per minute of uh, glomerular filtration rate, and liver function was still uh, preserved. So it's uh, probably a perfect time for an intervention because you may prevent organ dysfunction, which is then uh, the, the, the main cause of the progression and the lack of reversibility of heart failure. I agree, I agree, uh, Marco, completely with the assessment. And you know, I think the clinical evaluation is the first thing, uh, one of the most important. It has to be symptomatic with heart, uh, right heart failure and previous hospitalization maybe as well. Uh, but also we need to have, and this has been done by the team, uh, a very complete workup of that patient that are really complex. And I, I saw, you know, there was a CT scan, uh, there was a right heart catheterization. There is a lot of things we will discuss during this series, um, uh, pulmonary hypertension tension, right ventricular dysfunction, coronary artery disease is also an important point. Uh, but I think the, your point is a very important one. The previous history of the patient is important in that case uh, because tricuspid regurgitation was not treated at the time of, uh, of uh, mitral surgery. And I think that uh, something now we see the consequence of it and uh, that's something we should encourage, you know, early treatment in patients e even if uh, tricuspid regurgitation is not severe at the time of uh, concomitant left-sided surgery. So are you thinking on more percutaneous intervention than surgical now on this patient when you say it's the right moment to intervene? Uh, the patient uh, was, is having a high risk for surgery. So I, I, I would, uh, I mean, of course, I mean, all the discussion must be done uh, by the team uh, with the cardiac surgeons. But uh, I, I think that because of the age and uh, the, the, the severity of also uh, heart disease uh, and, uh, and also some degree of pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular dysfunction. And uh, we will come back to this probably, uh, but uh, the, the, the percutaneous intervention is, uh, is better for, for this patient. But again, it depends on the people gathering together and what they think. 
Okay, let's learn a little bit more on the prognosis, on the prevalence prognosis of uh, tricuspid regurgitation. And for this, we have a fantastic speaker who is Jan Topilski that has six minutes to teach us a little bit more on what we have learned from his and others' studies on this topic. Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marta. So we have six minutes to talk about the prevalence and uh, distribution of TR. The first study to look at that was the Framingham Heart Study, and they found that the prevalence of significant TR, which is more than moderate, was 0.8%, increasing with age and much greater in women. We've repeated that in the Olmsted County database in Mayo Clinic uh, several years ago, and we showed that indeed the prevalence of TR increases with age. You can see that above 75 years old is around 4% of the population. But for the US adjusted uh, burden, we're talking about 0.6% prevalence of TR, which is around 2 million Americans. And it's also similar to severe aortic stenosis, so a, a very common disease. Uh, you can see here in the graph in orange, that's the prevalence of TR increasing with age, compared in blue to the prevalence of all left valvular diseases. And again, as I said, TR is as common as AS. We're talking about severe TR. We also looked at the, diff, at the distribution of etiologies of severe TR in the community and found that the most common reason is TR related to left valvular disease, mostly mitral. But also, there's a significant contribution of what we call isolated TR. You can see that it's 8% of the patients. And these are patients that have functional TR with normal pulmonary pressure no left valvular disease, and normal LV and systolic and diastolic function. Nowadays, we know they are usually because of right atrial uh, dilatation. What is the outcome of untreated TR? So the first one to look at that was uh, Masika Zaytun, and that was said uh, like 20 years ago. And this is a very interesting group because flail TR usually is traumatic TR, so we know the exact date that TR started. And you can see here on the left that there is excess mortality. And you can see in the right panel that when RV is dilated, mortality increases significantly. But of course, functional TR is much more important. And this is our paper several years ago, looking at the isolated TR. Again, an interesting group because they don't have any other cardiac comorbidity and no systemic comorbidities. And you can see that in green, when ERO is above 0.4, there's excess mortality even if the patients are in sinus rhythm and even if they're asymptomatic. So TR by itself increases mortality. This is another paper from the Mayo Clinic group showing that when ERO is above 0.4 uh, and TR is associated with LV systolic dysfunction, it increases mortality even when adjusted for everything. And the same from Tel Aviv with diastolic dysfunction. TR increases mortality. What about untreated TR in the community? So again, we go back to our data in Olmsted County, and the blue bars show you one-year mortality after an echo done in the community. These are not hospitalized patients. And you can see that when TR is associated with LV systolic dysfunction or valvular disease in the middle, there's more than 25% mortality a year after the echo, sorry, done in the community. But even the isolated TR group on the right has more than 10% mortality. So this is a very uh, malignant disease. And the, 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 the mortality depends on the etiology, not just on the severity. And this is a recent paper, again, from Tel Aviv, with contemporary treatment showing, again, that severe TR is associated with excess mortality. We got a 50% mortality in one year with severe TR. Now, we calculated based on 2,500 patients with severe TR in Tel Aviv, a risk score based on several points. One is age, the second one is ejection fraction, the third one is systolic pulmonary pressure, then there's kidney disease, RV dysfunction, and liver disease. And you can see here that with increasing points, you have increasing mortality. And you can see that when you have a zero on the risk score, one-year mortality is around 2%, but when you have a high-risk score, it's almost 100% mortality in a year. And what is important is, of course, because this risk curve also increases mortality when you don't have TR, is that in the mid-range, TR increases mortality significantly. 
Or in other words, when the risk score is low, you will not die even if you have TR in one year. And when the risk score is very high, you will die either way, if you have TR or you don't have TR. But at the mid-range, TR increases mortality significantly. So if you look at our patient, uh, the age was 75. Uh, systolic pulmonary pressure was above 40, and he had RV dysfunction. So all around four points, and the risk of dying in one year with no treatment is almost 30% which is very high, of course. So if we summarize, severe TR is prevalent around 0.6% in the population similar to aortic stenosis. It adversely affects prognosis, but prognosis depends not only on severity, but also on the etiology of TR. Highest mortality when LV systolic dysfunction or left valvular disease. Adverse prognosis mostly at the mid-range risk score, but of course, many questions are still unanswered. I think I finished. Thank you very much, Jan. Fantastic learnings from Tel Aviv and from your group. So our patient has a 30% risk mortality. Not bad. Uh, I think we have questions from the audience. Fabian? Yes, Marta. So there is one uh, question maybe uh, related also a bit to your, uh, to your talk, Jan. So somebody is asking when Tricuspid valve intervention is mandatory. I think there is no such situation, actually. But maybe you can tell us what is the profile of the patient based on your risk score, on your experience, what kind of patient would benefit, and uh, in what, which kind of patient we should go for it, and what kind of patient is maybe a bit too late? So, so based on our data, I would say when, when, once the, uh, the risk score is above nine, which is usually because of renal dysfunction and liver dysfunction, the patient will die anyway. And treating the TR probably is useless. On the lower range, the patients will not die immediately if they don't, if they don't get treated. But still, I, I believe that it's better probably to treat them early because then the risk of the procedure is also very low and the cycle of deteriorating RV and, and, uh, and liver and kidney dysfunction is... is is, is, is not happening. But of course, at the mid-range, it's, it's very important to do a procedure because then, because then the TR itself is the cause of deterioration of liver and, and kidney function. And that usually gets us to an end-stage patient that cannot be treated anyway. There is another question from the audience uh, regarding the course of the patient uh, and whether this patient was lost to follow up after surgery. So we don't know exactly the answer, I think, but uh, there is, of course, uh, an issue with awareness about uh, tricuspid regurgitation, about the diagnosis of the disease. And I think, Becky, you will, will agree with that. Can you tell us a little bit what we need to improve for the diagnosis of this disease? Yeah, that's a really great question, and one of the one of the main issues uh, as far as uh, under treatment of the disease. Um, I wanted to make one comment about outcomes, which is that um, one should not just consider mortality um, and benefit and improvement in in survival. But many of these patients obviously are looking mainly to feel better, um, and what we've seen in many of our studies, and this relates to the quantification of severity of disease. Um, that patients are presenting now with what we are now calling massive or torrential disease. And Jan has done some beautiful studies also on uh, quantifying this, these additional grades of tricuspid regurgitation. But those patients are the ones that actually feel better, improve their six-minute walk distance, and improve their KCCQ. And so it depends a little bit on the discussion with the heart team as far as what the expectations of improvement are. And if it's um, you know having a quality of life versus a quantity of life, then uh, it's really hard for us to set <clears throat> limits on who on who we should treat. And, and I think that's one of the, the issues that we have currently, since many of our patients are presenting above a score of nine. <laughs> uh, absolutely, Becky. I think this is a very good point. It's not only on survival that we should care, but also on quality of life. And this is a very important issue right now in this elderly population. Uh, Dr. Mertra. Uh, just to point out that uh, the increase in central venous pressure and tricuspid regurgitation causes it is a major cause of kidney dysfunction and diuretic resistance and this is a major so it it is a major cause of poor quality of life for the patients so uh, there, there are good reasons to intervene beyond mortality 
So I think we have our first consensus, yeah. <laughs> at least here. <laughs> so we would be uh, more in favor of intervening, interventing, uh, indicating intervention on, on this patient. Uh, we will further discuss which type of intervention. Uh, I think another, uh, if you have more questions, uh, but I think another issue that we have learned a lot and, did, and that needs to be clarified is a little bit on the functional anatomy and the classification of tricuspid regurgitation. As you know, the tricuspid valve has been forgotten for many years and also from the uh, anatomical uh, and even imaging point of view, it has been not been well classified. So I think to clarify this issue, we also have now Denisa Muraro, Dr. Denisa Muraro, who will uh, teach us on this aspect. So Denisa, uh, uh, tell us on anatomy of tricuspid valve and uh, classification we have and the proposals that are upcoming. The floor is yours, Denisa. Thank you very much, Marta, and uh, good evening, uh, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be part of this webinar. So indeed, as you said, um, the tricuspid valve has been neglected uh, for years. And uh, in the current era of expanded trascatheter procedures to treat the tricuspid valve, it's, uh, uh, we have a need to uh, better understand the anatomy and the functional interplay between the different components of the tricuspid valve apparatus. And multimodality imaging is key to provide this anatomical information. Due to the sake of time, I will uh, just address the anatomy of the leaflets, the, so the structure, the number, and also the classification of tricuspid uh, regurgitation. So, so the anatomists have uh, teached us, the imagers, that the tricuspid valve is not uh, just a mitral valve that stands on the right with uh, three leaflets. Actually, it is very complex and variable structure of the human body. And this is because uh, the anatomists are able to see the valve as a whole, while many years uh, conventional two-dimensional echocardiography does not allow us to see the valve, and we had only limited views showing only two leaflets at a time. The advent of three-dimensional echocardiography has represented a great step in understanding the tricuspid anatomy. And as you can see here, we can appreciate by transthoracic three-dimensional echocardiography different morphologies of the tricuspid valve in patients with TR, three leaflets, four leaflets, two leaflets, or even five or uh, six scallops. And seeing actually the dynamic morphology and function of the valve is essential to understand the mechanism uh, of the regurgitation and how to treat these patients. Uh, as you can see from uh, these uh, two-dimensional images, if you look at the valve in two-dimensional longitudinal views, uh, they are quite unremarkable. So it is essential to obtain unfast views of the valve, either by transesophageal transgastic approach or by 3D. Otherwise, it is very difficult to um, understand which valves are uh, having supernumerary leaflets. And uh, now um, also um, the, the work done uh, previously by, um, by Rebecca Hahn and the co-workers uh, have allowed us to, to obtain much more uh, information on the anatomy. And so uh, there was a great need to uh, classify these uh, uh, abnormalities uh, of, the, of the anatomy. And uh, the work done by Rebecca has shown that there are actually four types of uh, tricuspid valve uh, from one to four. And the most uh, frequent morphology is the one having four leaflets and uh, uh, with two posterior. Um, actually, when you look at, um, at uh, the valve with a three-dimensional echocardiography, you are able to appreciate uh, several uh, anatomical details that might change the interventional approach. For instance, um, these complex valves may have a complex-shaped orifice, as represented in this slide. So depending on the position of the cut-in plane, uh, the co uh, coaptation gap may be highly variable, and also there might be more uh, difficult to quantify using single-plane measurements. Uh, 
Regarding the classification of the tricuspid regurgitation based on leaflet abnormalities, uh, by far it's most frequent the secondary type. And the recent guidelines have identified, as Jan was saying, the isolated or secondary TR, which is an exclusion diagnosis because it excludes all other known causes of uh, uh, functional TR. These are patients that have a very uh, unique uh, phenotype, having very small right ventricles, very large right atrium, and they have minimal tethering and dilated annulus. Therefore, at the moment, uh, the proposed classification by the tricuspid um, PCR focus group is to have uh, three uh, categories of tricuspid regurgitation in which on the functional or secondary category, there is uh, the clear distinction between the atrial and the ventricular form, which uh, both correspond to either Carpentier type 1 and Carpentier type uh, 3b. And as you can see uh, here, also the one related to the catheter uh, or the devices on the right heart should be listed uh, separately because the management and the outcome of these patients are completely different than the primary one. So I hope that this brief presentation has addressed uh, some of the issues that will be helpful to uh, assess our patient. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denisa. I, th I think this was very nice. And we have also Becky that uh, proposed this classification and maybe wants to add something on this issue, particularly on the implications of this anatomy for treatment, for example, on the outcomes. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Yeah, our, 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 our feeling was that we needed to be able to identify the leaflet morphology uh, primarily because of the tier devices, transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair devices. Um, obviously, if you have three leaflets versus having five leaflets, um, your procedural pre-procedural -pre planning changes a lot. Um, and uh, we already have one study that shows perhaps technical success is a little bit lower uh, if you have anything other than a, a three leaflet uh, a valve. So the four leaflet valves tend to have a little bit lower technical success, but the uh, otherwise the hard outcomes of, of survival seem to be the same. But there are other papers that, that will come out and obviously we have randomized studies now uh, looking at the tier devices and uh, about we will be able to evaluate the actual uh, technical and procedural success against uh, hard outcomes as well in the future. Um, but also just knowing where those uh, commissures are makes a difference also for our, our transcatheter replacement devices. So right now the only device in, uh, in pivotal trial is the evoke device and it has nine anchors that need to be placed positioned um, uh, underneath the annulus and capture the leaflets. And Obviously, the more commissures you have, the more difficult it is to actually be underneath a leaflet. Um, and so we do believe that that kind of morphology is going to play a role in um, the device choice, but also uh, device planning. So keep, keep us posted on the upcoming news. Uh, Fabian, do you have a question from the audience? Question from the audience. A very interesting one. Do you see trauma causing tri tricuspid valve dysfunction in real life practice? Maybe for you, Denisa. Is trauma yes. also a reason for TR? Yes, absolutely. We had uh, several cases of trauma. Unfortunately, these patients might not get recognized at the moment of trauma and they may present very late after 20, 30 years. And we had a very nice case that actually seemed to be functional because it was a very uh, advanced stage. But uh, and uh, the flail was difficult to recognize into the images. So. Yes, we, we see those, especially the anterior leaflet is the most affected because of the position in the chest. And then another question for you, Becky, it's a difficult one. Is there a cutoff for the right ventricle size, basal diameter, to, uh, to uh, undergo intervention? Yeah, wow, well, that's, uh, uh, yeah, oh, sorry, my lights just went up, but um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, um, uh, an interesting question. So we don't yet really understand, you know, uh, it, it probably coming from uh, the mitral far versus coapt and the size of the, of the LV. Undoubtedly, there'll be, there'll be some parameters that we'll end up using for RV um, dimension and size, we do, we, uh, dimension and, and function, uh, but we don't know what those are yet. Um, we also know that the RV happens to be a very plastic side. It, it, it can recover. So we have patients who have um, severe uh, 
pulmonary hypertension, undergo a lung transplant, the RV looks terrible, and then it recovers completely. So um, we, we just don't know yet on the right ventricular side. We're trying to figure out um, how big, uh, how much tethering, is it the base of the ventricle or is it the mid-ventricle where the papillary muscles are attached? Um, is that the more important measurement? And then for function, there's just so many different ways that we can measure function, and we just don't know what will be predictive of long-term outcomes as well as recovery. Marco, you had a very nice study on the, the, the importance of right ventricular function in patients with mitral regurgitation. So what do you think? There is no limit? We can treat all these patients or there is a futility? Well, it's, uh, mitral regurgitation is one thing. Another thing is tricuspid. Uh, and uh, yes, in, in, um, we analyzed the patients without the co-opt criteria. And among them, right ventricular dysfunction was one of the major uh, prognostic uh, variable uh, together with uh, hemodynamic, inst with clinical instability and <coughs> a, a, a low ejection fraction. But for sure, right ventricular dysfunction is a major driver of the outcome of the patients undergoing mitral valve procedures. Um, we, we can guess also the same for tricuspid, but uh, is, th there is much more reversibility probably uh, depending on the, the loading conditions. May I ask to you what is the <laughs> role of pulmonary hypertension and to Rebecca and Denise uh, in, uh, in, uh, for planning a tricuspid procedure? Well, that's something we, we didn't touch too much, but there is, uh, of course, the importance of right catheterization. Mm. And I think uh, that's something, I don't know if uh, Becky can, can um, also add something on that, but that's something we do in every patient uh, at our center. So we try to uh, define the etiology of, uh, of uh, pulmonary hypertension if there is one. But I think we need to be aware that we are under, underestimating that problem a lot in patients with severe or very severe tricuspid regurgitation. And that's uh, the parameter we need to look at are the resistance uh, more than the pressure we actually uh, we actually measure. Yeah, just yeah. Uh, as we all know, like severe tricuspid regurgitation and equalization of pressures across the RV and the and the RA uh, will uh, force the echocardiographic measure to be underestimated. Uh, to underestimate the true uh, RV systolic pressure. But in the study by Philip Lertz, who um, did invasive and echo, that only occurred in about 25% of patients with severe to torrential tricuspid regurgitation. And so, you know, he looked at various parameters that we might be able to guess uh, as to which patients were going to have discordance, you know, the triangulation of the, of the spectral profile, the severity of the RV function, et cetera. Um, and I think we can pinpoint those patients where invasive is, is going to definitely be needed and other patients where, you know, echo is good enough and uh, we should proceed, you know, with a, with a procedure. Um, but also he looked at RVPA coupling, and that's a measure that we are really enamored of at this point. Um, just looked at the trivalve registry. We hope to have that manuscript accepted soon. Uh, and RVPA coupling is going to predict outcomes in the tricuspid regurgitation patients. Great, Becky. Uh, I think we have to, to, to move. Before we analyze the images of this patient, uh, which is something that I'm looking forward to the, hearing the discussion, uh, we want to hear uh, Professor Erwan Donald precisely talking on the uh, quantification and on the evaluation of severity of tricuspid regurgitation. So, Erwan. Thank you, Marta. Thank you very much for this kind invitation. It's a real pleasure to be with you tonight. And uh, I really want to emphasize what has been already said, that uh, there is a need to better understand and to better assess the patient with a tricuspid regurg. We should be aware of the prognosis linked to this pathology. And then we have to assess precisely anatomy, etiology, mechanism, and severity of the TR. And we shouldn't forget about the consequences of the TR on the RV chambers. And then I would like to emphasize that we have to use TTE, transthoracic echo, to assess the size and the function of the right ventricle as well as the right atrium. It's important to look at the size despite the fact that we don't know about the cutoff values, but it's also important to assess precisely the function of the right ventricle. I will come back to that. Uh, and just to emphasize this point about the RV function, Perhaps the size is not that important according to the ongoing studies, but the function is key. And then we have to use the TAPC, the S prime, the, the change in area over time, but we have to use also the strain data set. 
it seems in several studies that the strain of the RV is quite important to assess if you want to understand better about the RV function in patients with TR. And then we also have to assess the analysis of the tricuspid valve. It's very important to look at these diameters in parasternal as well as in apical views in TTE. We can use these fancy tools that can be uh, applied to transthoracic echo and transesophageal echo. But over the size, we also have to look at the geometry of the tricuspid annulus. And it's very important to use these tools to better understand if there is a flattering of the tricuspid annulus or not. And it will help us to understand what will happen afterwards. And then, as I said, we have to look at the anatomy of the tricuspid valve. It has been mentioned by Denisa. We have to look at the mechanism of the TR, the severity, I will come back to that. But as it has been mentioned just before, we have to assess precisely the primary pressure. And for the assessment of the tricuspid valve, we can have this uh, figure in mind. It's quite important to remind uh, that we, when we will have to treat the patient if we use clips, we will consider the clipping of the anterior and the septal leaflet first. And then we will have to decide if we implant a clip on the posterior and the septal leaflet or not. So usually we start by the septal and the anterior. We can also uh, put another one on the anterior and the septal, or we can also look at the posterior and the septal leaflets. And then we have to assess very precisely the anatomy. And the key point is that we shouldn't forget about the transgastric view. The transgastric view is fundamental to assess the anatomy of the tricuspid valve. So make sure that you get a perfect transgastric view if you want to assess the tricuspid valve and if you want to treat this tricuspid valve. And then you know that the anterior leaflet is the longest one, the septal leaflet is the shortest one and the, more apic the most apical one, and the posterior leaflet is the more com complicated to assess because most of the time we have multiple scallops and it's very complicated to understand where it stops and when it starts. And Modeliza told us about this important classification, distinguishing the arterial TR, but also the TR that is related to the pacemaker leads. And it's important to understand when we have a pacemaker leads, where are the leads, uh, where if there is a link between the tricuspid rigors and the leads crossing the tricuspid valve. And then we use the TTE, the 2D, and the, the, the 3D TTE, as it has been mentioned by Denisa, because it's very convenient to use the 3D TTE to understand the anatomy of the leaflets. We shouldn't forget about the parasternal views. We shouldn't look only at the, the apical views, but we have to assess precisely the leaflets using the parasternal views also. And of course, we will use the transesophageal approach. And this transesophageal approach, it's important to see the gaps, to quantify also the TR, and to plan the intervention. We will use the biplane mode, the 3D mode, and we shouldn't forget, as I told you already, about the transgastric view. And then we will quantify the rigor. And if we want to quantify the rigor, we have to make sure that we quantif quantify the rigor in a, patient, oh, sorry, in a patient that has been treated optimally. It means that you shouldn't, if I can go back. Yes, we shouldn't assess the severity of a TR in a patient that is too overload. So optimize the diuretics first and then quantify the TR. And when we want to quantify the TR, you have to keep in mind that if you want to uh, assess after the treatment, the result of your treatment, you have to get a five grade classification. You have to distinguish the torrential and the massive TR because it can be something that impacts the prognosis of your patient. And of course, there is no magic number, no magic number. You have to measure several parameters, at least the vena contracta and the regular piece area. You have to assess the vena contracta by 2D and by 3D if you can, and you shouldn't forget about all the quantitative parameters that you can assess to better to make sure that you understand the, the severity of the TR. Be aware that when the TR is laminar, it, it could be 
difficult to make sure that there is a severe tear. But if the tear is laminar, you have a huge gap between the leaflets. And if there is a huge gap between the leaflets, the tear is probably torrential. So you have to be careful and look very precisely at the leaflets before that you open the color mode. So you use the color mode, of course, but you look at the leaflet first. And you use all the views that you have in TTE and TEE to assess this tricuspid valve. And you shouldn't forget about the continuous Doppler. If you have this triangulation story uh, of the continuous Doppler with this velocity that is below 2.5, you probably have a torrential TR. So it's very simple. And then I, I have to finish my talk. And um, I will really want to emphasize the TEE. The TEE is a bit different from the TEE we use in the other pathology. We will use the mid TEE, the mid esophagus TEE, but we have also to assess in biplane the patient in deep TEE. It's more easy, it's easier to assess the tricuspid valve if you are deep in the esophagus. And as I told you already, don't forget about the transgastric view and use the biplane mode. And it has been mentioned already, you have to quantify the uh, pulmonary pressure. Echo is very nice, but it's not always perfect. So use also the right cat to make sure that you, uh, you don't uh, underestimate a pulmonary hypertension if you are in duct after the, the TTE. And then I have to finish my talk, and I really want to emphasize that we have to take care of the, this tricuspid regurgitation. We have to understand why there is a tricuspid regurg. Is it due to the atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension, left heart diseases? And then we have to quantify the airway function. We have to understand the anatomy of the right heart. And then we will quantify the tricuspid regurg using a standardized approach of TTE and TEE. Thank you very much. Thank you, very Thank you very much, everyone, for keeping in time. So we have many questions for you, but we have lots of questions from the audience that we will try to respond. Uh, Fabian. Uh, so, Evan, you, you answered already uh -huh. a lot of questions, but there, there are more. The, the people are very interested. So uh, they ask about the concept of proportionality for uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Uh -huh. So are you a believer or not? <laughs> wow, it's a, it's a tough question, actually. Um, I don't know yet. I cannot say that I believe or I don't believe. I think we have to work more. We have huge data sets uh, in New York, but also in Europe. We have uh, many patients that have been treated. So we have to look very carefully at these patients to best understand what's going on. But I think that proportionate and disproportionate works quite well for the mitral rigors. I really think that for the tricuspid rigors, we have to look very carefully at the function of the right ventricular. And Becky, is there a question for you as well? The people are interested in the right ventricular uh, coupling, so uh, which you mentioned before. How do we calculate this very briefly? Yeah, uh, there are multiple non-invasive ways uh, as well as invasive ways. The original, obviously, is an invasive um, uh, catheter uh, measurement of uh, end systolic stress and uh, end systolic volumes, but the uh, the non-invasive ways is to uh, take any kind of uh, uh, echocardiographic measure of function. So the easiest is TAPSI, um, and so there's a lot of da data with with TAPSI, and that's what will come out with the trivalve registry, and then a measure of pulmonary um, uh, arterial resistance or uh, afterload, and so frequently we'll uh, use a surrogate of PA systolic pressure. So uh, RV function divided by PA pressure, and that gives you the RV-PA coupling. Obviously, the higher uh, it means you're coupled, um, and the RV is going to respond well to uh, increasing af afterload um, or continue to maintain that coupling. And then as you um, uh, have higher and higher PA pressures, you may get to a point where you are uncoupled. Um, and now the RV cannot respond to the increase in afterload. And this is this is something that we worry about with the transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement devices, uh, since you're actually taking away all of the tricuspid regurgitation, increasing tremendously the afterload. Um, and can the RV actually respond uh, to that increase in afterload with uh, improvement in forward stroke volume? And this is something we don't know. So actually, an increase of PA pressure after a procedure is not necessarily a bad sign. It's a sign of, uh, of, uh, of an effective reduction of, of TR, but 
the risk of failure is, is there. And there is a question for Denisa as well. It's a question I have been asking myself a long time. How do we make the difference between a secondary tricuspid regurgitation or a tricuspid regurgitation long time due to a pacemaker? Is there a way to do that? Of course. Uh, so uh, with a pacemaker, we need to uh, make sure that we have uh, a good visualization of the leaflets and uh, of their uh, relationship with the catheter. And so um, the, in this, uh, I think, three-dimensional echocardiography, uh, transthoracic is fundamental because it is the only way to uh, document if there is an impingement of uh, one of the leaflets of the, of the catheter. It's not always easy to make this diagnosis because sometimes you might think that there is an impingement and then you treat the patient and the tricuspid regurgitation uh, maybe uh, reduces. So I, I admit that there are some uh, pitfalls in that, but uh, without three-dimensional echocardiography, this diagnosis is really challenging. And uh, it's also having uh, very important practical consequences because if you detect this mechanism earlier, you can solve it by just repositioning the catheter. So it's not always easy, but it's mostly feasible in most of the patients. So let's move back to our patient and let's go back to her imaging because we've seen from the, our colleagues in Toulouse very quick images, not moving images. So we want to go to the detailed discussion of the imaging uh, of this patient. We will start with the echocardiography. If you can show the slides. Okay, so here you have two shots of the, of the transthoracic echocardiography. So you can... Uh, and also here you have a zoom-in image of the tricuspid valve. Uh, I'm showing this to have the discussion later on. So here is how we could assess PISA and vena contracta. So this is the transesophageal for chamber views, uh, where you can see same image, black and white and color, with uh, severe tricuspid regurgitation, the measurement of the annulus. We can discuss that later on with all the team. And we have here the biplane images that Erwan was uh, asking us to use from uh, the, the, what we call intercommissural or RV inflow outflow view because we see the inflow on the outflow of the right ventricle and we are cutting in the more anterior aspect of the tricuspid valve here. Uh, in this one in the mid part of the valve and we can see here the, the PISA of the tricuspid regurgitation indicating that the origin of the jet is quite central. We go to the transgastric, sorry, this was very quick. <laughs> Let me go back to... We'll have to move forward, the measurement of the gap here. We have the 3D view there with color so we can see a central orifice, regurgitant orifice and the color coming from there. And from here, I would like to open the discussion with Becky, uh, Denisa, Erwan, Jan, whoever wants to join our discussion. And the first thing that we'd like to discuss is on the quantification with the PISA and all the other issues that you want to raise. Becky, what do you yeah. think? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the, the imaging was quite beautiful with the PISA. And you can see that um, in this slow-mo, you know, slow motion, um, frame by frame look at the PISA, how temporally variable the PISA is. And so one of the problems that we have is that the guidelines use PISA as the primary method of quantitation of the regurgitant orifice. And there are so many pitfalls. This is one of them. Um, and you can see the change in the radius um, over the course of systole uh, with the little graph on the far right. But in addition, um, if leaflets are tethered or with a stellate shaped opening, all of the uh, assumptions of the PISA, which would be of a circular hole and a flat surface, um, are not fulfilled. And therefore, um, PISA has a lot of problems with quantifying accurately um, the actual regurgitant orifice. And that's why we've gone to using quantitative Doppler and three-dimensional vena contracta area. So, so you could uh, go more in favor as kind of not the only, but kind of the most perfect or less bad <laughs> uh, parameter, the 3D vena contracta, no, Becky? 
Yeah, I think it's uh, easiest to measure. Um, but remember also because of the temporal variability uh, that we like to go ahead and, and get an average of everything. So we get an, an integrated, what's called an integrated PISA, which would be multiple measurements, typically will stick to uh, the mid systolic uh, portion of the, you know, uh, uh, of the systolic time interval. And then we'll do the same for the 3D vena contracta. We'll get a, a, an integrated 3D VCA to be a little bit more accurate about uh, the, the changes that occur um, over, the, uh, over the systolic time interval. Fantastic. Unfortunately, we didn't have the transgastric, but we have this nice NPR from the colleagues from Toulouse. So if you, if you want to comment on the morphology and maybe on the gap uh, that you can see here on the NPR, and maybe Denisa also wants to comment on this. I yeah, think you had this slide, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, it looked to me like it was going to be a quadricuspid valve and um, that perhaps uh, there, there could feasibly be two landing zones. Um, um, but if uh, they aim to, to get P1 to septal, uh, then uh, that, may be, that may get you a good result with a single device. Um, but we generated this scheme by, um, by first starting all the numbering from the anteroseptal commissure just to make it easier because that's a very consistent uh, anatomic uh, location. You, you'll always see a commissure there. Um, and then uh, to um, uh, identify the anterior papillary muscle to differentiate posterior from anterior. And then from there, it's just, you know, what's connected to the septum and what's not connected to the septum um, as far as the septal leaflet. Um, and that's why I think this is a quadricuspid, um, but uh, interested to hear what Denisa says. Yeah, Becky, you're right. And I think you showed very elegantly in your paper that it's very important to use color Doppler either in transgastric or 3D to be uh, sure about the morphology because you never uh, can say 100% sure in uh, just uh, 2D or 3D slices. And uh, in this case, I think it would be very nice. It's important to slice the 3D color exactly at the leaflet tips. And so therefore 3D could, uh, could help. But uh, um, I think this case is very interesting from another point of view because it illustrates very nicely also the challenges that we face when we are scanning these patients with uh, transesophageal uh, uh, echocardiography. So uh, you know that uh, it's quite challenging, uh, the tricuspid valve in TE, sometimes even more than in transthoracic because of the position, anterior position, and also because the leaflets are thinner. And uh, in, in this particular patient, there is the problem of the acoustic shadowing related to the presence of the prosthetic material proximally. So uh, Becky uh, has shown also in, in her uh, beautiful papers that uh, one way to deal with this uh, technical issue is to advance the probe and to get a, a deep esophageal view. And also the transgastric view may be helpful in this case in order to appreciate much better uh, the anatomy. When you have these dropouts, it's very difficult to quantify the gap. Also, color Doppler may be uh, used to make the differential diagnosis be between uh, a dropout and the true gap. Thank, thank you both. So uh, I think before discussing which type of intervention or which device, which uh, we should uh, go very quickly through the, the CT also. So you have here some measurements of the annulus, the right atrium size, also the tricuspid uh, valve annulus area. Uh, so here are also some measurements of the, of the relationships of the tricuspid annulus to the right coronary artery and also the relationship with the entrance of the coronary sinus and the superior and inferior vena cava. And uh, I think here we can project this angulation. And if we go to a more, maybe to a different view, this is a, a 3D render volume where you can see there is a little bit of tortuosity at the entrance of the inferior cava, which is usually not a problem for interventional cardiologists. But you can see here the angulation of, of the catheter when it goes direct towards the tricuspid valve. Uh, maybe some comment from Denisa for the measurement of the annulus that you wanted to highlight. Yeah, again, in this case, I think looking at the anatomy, at the shape of the right ventricle with this basal bulge is important, and also how there is this tapering of, of the annulus inside the cavity. This uh, 
might be very challenging to understand on steel frames like in CT, which is, is exactly the hinge point of the leaflets to make the measurements. And as you have seen, there is some uh, ver small variability in the measurements that one may get from CT, echo, or uh, in which uh, with echo you have the possibility to look at the mo mobile part. So um, these are uh, real life issues that we need to know how to, how to tackle and integrating uh, the mobility of the leaflet with the CT data might be helpful to understand where to, uh, to pinpoint the measurement. Thank you, Denisa, for raising that point. So, so uh, Dr. Han, what do you think would be uh, your uh, suggestion for the type of device this patient should undergo, according yeah, to I the imaging? Or I'm, I'm asking Becky, but probably any of you want to want to suggest their opinion. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it seems as though the gap is, is doable for a transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair. Um, the uh, annular dimensions are also adequate for a transcatheter valve replacement. Uh, though we definitely have devices that would, that, that, uh, would be appropriate sizes. Um, sometimes we also consider um, the image quality. So if you're not able to, because we'll, we we do need to see the septal leaflet, no question. Um, and if you can't see the septal leaflet, it's really hard to do a transcatheter edge to edge repair, but it's much easier to do a transcatheter replacement device where we're not actually trying to see the leaflet within a grasp, um, but we just wanna see the leaflet on one side or the other of, a, of, a, 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 of an anchor. Um, and so those tough imaging cases might tend to favor a little bit more replacement devices, which um, don't require a lot of uh, intense imaging of the, of, the, of the leaflet tips and the, and, the, and the body of the leaflet. And then um, the, the angle though that you showed, uh, Marta, that was beautiful. There, there are two different angles that we measure. One of them is the angle obviously um, from the IVC down to the, to the annular plane. But the second image that you showed, I don't know if you could go back um, a couple of slides, uh, this one. Um, so uh, the angle uh, of approach that goes into the inner atrial septum, uh, that's the first angle that we deal with. So there's two angles that we look at. The first is the approach of the IVC into uh, the right atrium. And then the second is how it bends down in, uh, toward the tricuspid valve. And this is a daunting uh, angle for a transcatheter replacement device to maneuver itself um, you know, from to get itself off the inner atrial septum and then back down again to uh, the tricuspid valve annulus. So uh, all in all, if you ask, I, I, I think perhaps a tear device uh, might be the simplest way to go. So that would be your first choice. Any other choice here in Paris? So there is a question actually from the audience about cavi device, about uh, implantation of an heterotopic valve into the, the vena cava. And I think, you know, in, in that situation, uh, probably the patient, as uh, Marco mentioned as well, uh, is probably not um, advanced enough uh, to, to have this, this treatment probably and, and the treatment that will uh, repair the valve and improve cardiac output is probably a better way to, to approach this patient at that time. Um, with that anatomy. There is also a question for you, Marco. Uh, in a patient with uh, unsolved left-sided uh, disease, would you treat TR or is it something you would not do? <laughs> with the perfect mitral valve. <laughs> so mitral valve already done. Uh, well, also the patient, our case, and we will see next uh, <laughs> episodes, uh, she had uh, a wedge pressure which was above normal. It was around 20. So she, she had uh, some degree of postcapillary pulmonary hypertension. So I, I don't think it's, uh, it's mandatory to have a perfect left ventricle. It's much more important that the pulmonary to right ventricle coupling, as uh, Becky was mentioned. And I'm more so curious how, how much can you, I'm not an imaging specialist, how much can you get about the, the, how thin are the leaflets so that you prefer uh, as a um, tricuspid valve uh, substitution rather than, uh, than uh, clipping, as, as it was mentioned before. 
That's, a, that's an issue, yeah, of course. Yeah. The, 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 of course. the thickness of the, yes. of the leaflet that is very different as on, on the mitral valve. Yes. Um, and the risk of uh, single leaflet device attachment is certainly something you need to, yes. to take into account. Uh, and is certainly more frequent than yes. on, the, on the mitral valve. Uh, and for how, sure. how much the imaging can, can the take? The imaging you. is absolutely key. Yeah. Absolutely key. Absolutely key. And in two minutes, I will ask Fabian yeah, to yes, show yes, uh, a little bit, <laughs> particularly for those who are not yeah. so uh, used to imaging, a little bit on echo anatomy, for, especially for cardiac uh, interventionalists. Yeah, that's, that's a bit of, uh, of uh, um, a summary of the session for those who have not understand everything like me, uh, because they are not <laughs> the major. Uh, I just wanted to show what is the most important thing we have seen today. So basically, we are imaging, uh, we have here her things from Becky and from Irvan. We are imaging the, the heart from posterior, from the esophagus. We are looking at the mid and deep esophageal view because that's the one showing us the leaflet best. But what we have to be careful when we look at the images as an interventionalist is the orientation of the heart. And as you can see, because we are looking from posterior with a TE probe here from mid or deep esophageal, <laughs> uh, the aortic valve is down on the image and the posterior leaflet as well as a septal, as you can see here on the image of our patient, are up. So that's the situation you have uh, on, on uh, most of the T images. Of course, you can change this as well, but that's the situation. So posterior is up on the images you are looking from here, and the anterior leaflet is on the opposite. So that's a bit on a transcatastric view, how you can orientate yourself, very important for the orientation of the procedure. It may be a bit different by guidelines from the, uh, from with 3D, with 3D TE, because the RT valve here will be on top, but that's also something you can change, uh, not only in your mind, but also on the machine. But if you keep with that surgical view, then uh, the, the anterior leaflet will be on top on the image, and you will see the septal and posterior leaflet as shown on the image of, of our uh, patient. And finally, I wanted to show you the most important uh, view uh, mentioned by Ervan as well. Uh, it's uh, RVOT in view for grasping. And in that view, if you place an X-plane on that, you will ask your imager to place an X-plane anteriorly towards the aortic valve. Then you will, you will visualize the septal leaflet here and the anterior leaflet here uh, so that you know uh, what, which leaflet you are grasping. And if you move move then the X-plane, then posteriorly away from the aortic valve, then you will image the septal and the posterior leaflet. There is a lot of variation, but that's basically uh, what you can see as an interventionalist when you are looking at the images uh, produced by your uh, ECHO team. Thank you very much. Uh, you were really on time. Unfortunately, we have no more time for discussion. I think we could uh, be discussing this patient for hours uh, with all the team. But I just want you to summarize, to wrap up, uh, reminding that we have a patient, lady 75 years old, severe TR, with a pro uh, uh, poor prognosis, mortality estimated uh, by Dr. Topilski, 30% high surgical risk and we have looked through the images we have discussed and the consensus here is that this patient could have an intervention to improve her prognosis and that this intervention should be percutaneous and probably the first choice should be uh, transcatheter H2H repair. This is our p opinion, uh, but we don't know what's going to happen. So if you want to know what's going to happen with this patient, please join us again in the upcoming second episode on tricuspid regurgitation on next October 19th. So thank you very much to all the audience to be with us. Thank you to this fantastic team here in Paris, New York, uh, France, Italy, and Israel. And thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to see you back in October. Thank you.